Hello, my name is Will Rycroft and this is the Waterstones podcast. In this episode, which is called Talking, uh, we are unsurprisingly going to be doing some talking. And what we'll be talking about is the importance of conversation and communication and connection and not being afraid to tackle the hardest of topics, both in fiction and in non-fiction too. My first guest is Marion Keyes, who has been delighting readers since 1995 with novels that managed to touch on some really, really difficult topics, but with this extraordinary lightness of touch. And this year, she returned to her beloved creation, Rachel Walsh, uh, from her classic novel, Rachel's Holiday, uh, to show us what she'd been up to in the intervening years in Again, Rachel. Welcome, Marion. Thank you for having me, Will. Uh, my next guest is Candice Carty Williams, who, after the phenomenal success of Queenie, has returned this year with People Person, which is a book in which five half siblings, united by an absentee father, discover the important bonds of family in adulthood. Now, Candice has many accolades to her name already, including Book of the Year at the British Book Awards, but today actually marks the point at which she is crowned the most frequently returned guest to this podcast, which is all due to you making the mistake of answering my calls, Candice. So welcome once again. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, joining them is radio and TV presenter uh, and soon-to-be author Nihal Arthanayaka, who has amassed more awards and silverware than his beloved Tottenham Hotspur, I'm afraid, in a career Not which difficult. now sees him <laughs> one of the most respected interviewers out there, which obviously puts a bit of pressure on me today. Uh, his new book, Let's Talk, draws on his professional uh, experience and that of some of his favourite interviewees, um, and it provides guidance on how we can all be having better conversations. So welcome, Nihal. I will. Uh, and last, but by no means least, especially because we will be talking about some tricky things today, uh, it is Mental Health Awareness Week this week, um, we are joined by Dr Julie Smith, a clinical psychologist who can, uh, who's, who's actually caused nothing less than a sensation on social media when she took to TikTok to share short videos with insights from her work, uh, which made mental health very accessible to people uh, because even TikTok has its limits. Uh, this year she published her book, Why Has Nobody Told Me This Before?, which arms the reader with some of the tools that are required to begin to deal with a really wide range of mental health issues. So welcome, Julie. Thanks for having me. As mentioned, uh, as a warning for listeners, during this conversation, we will be discussing issues like addiction, violence, depression, and other mental health issues. If you want to reach out to someone by anything that's raised in this conversation, then the Samaritans, of course, are always there to begin that conversation. So, Marin, I'd like to begin with you, if I can. Um, I've just listed some of the things that we might be talking about in this conversation, and those topics are all things that you have raised in your books, and many more issues besides. Um, but you've managed to do all that uh, whilst writing what some people describe as popular fiction, which is always a slightly strange term to me, but these incredibly popular books that are wise and witty and funny, but you have dealt with some incredibly important topics. And I wondered, first of all, which comes first for you when you sit down to write? Is it character? Is it plot? Is it content? Um, it's character that I start with. Um, and I think that's because as an addict myself, a recovering addict, I and you know, and I've suffered from depression. I know that those things are incredibly mainstream. They're incredibly normal. Um, I think as a society, you know, we try to other addicts. You know, we try to pretend that they're not there. And for me, I felt like I was living a very regular life. You know, like I had a job and I was so-called middle class, and and still I was drinking alcoholically. You know, I was feeling suicidal. I was planning it, and I thought, if somebody like me is an addict and a depressive, there must be lots more like me. So, you know, to incorporate things like, you know, very poor mental health in, as you say, popular fiction. You know, when, you know, I'm writing love stories and stories about friendship and comedies. Um, it just feels to me like it's, it's no big deal and we shouldn't make addiction or depression, you know, a big, scary, no-go area because it walks among us, it's mainstream. Um, so it never feels like I kind of sit down to, to kind of write a book about addiction. You know, if it comes, it comes because there's every chance it will, because it's so pervasive. Of course, it is pervasive. And as you say, it's something that you've experienced yourself. And sitting down to write about that, even though, of course, it's in a fictional context, 
I'm presuming that it isn't easy, therefore, to sit down and write about it because you must have to confront some of the things that you've had to confront yourself. Oddly enough, it is easy. I mean, especially the addiction stuff. I know and people often say, like, is your fiction cathartic? It absolutely isn't. You know, uh, I, and I'm uncomfortable with the idea of using uh, writing a novel to kind of work out my own stuff. I need to be on very solid ground and I need to know my facts. And I suppose I need to be able to go in and write dispassionately. So, you know, and I'm very at peace about being an addict. You know, it's I, I certainly don't blame myself. It's not something I would have wished for myself. Um, it's not my fault. It's not a moral failing. You know, it's not because I'm greedy or weak. Um, so, no, I'm I'm. I'm quite, yeah, dispassionate about it. Um, it doesn't upset me in the slightest. You mentioned that you begin with character and Rachel Walsh is a character that, of course, readers have taken to their heart over the last you know, 20 plus years. The decision to return to her is a significant one because you've written about other members of the Walsh family, but not then return to another one of them. So I wonder where that decision came from. Oh God, I wish I had a great story, uh, you know, to make <laughs> this very, very interesting. I don't know. I mean, I had always been against the idea of sequels because for me, it felt like selling the reader short, but I missed the Walshes. And I suppose of all the Walsh sisters to return to, Rachel was the most obvious one because we're both addicts, you know? And I mean, that is a very... Uh, you know, I, I have enormous kind of affection and tenderness and compassion for other addicts. Um, so I don't know. And enough time had passed that it didn't feel like, you know, we picked up again the next day, like it was 20 years later, you know, that I revisited her. And it was interesting to see how a person copes in long term recovery because most stories about addiction will end with either the person dying or the person getting clean. But we don't see how a person kind of lives five years on, 12 years on. And, and that interests me. So I, I, it's probably that. It was looking at long-term recovery. Candice, I'm going to come to you because it's really interesting what Marin was saying about having that clear separation between the personal and, and the inspirations that go into your writing fiction and the, the characters that you create. Because I know that with Queenie, there will have been plenty of people who would assume that Queenie is an extension of you. And then with people person, of course, there are other things from your own personal life, I'm sure, feeding into that story. But again, was it the same for you that there is a very clear mark between you and your life and what might inspire your writing and then the writing itself? Yeah, absolutely. And I think one of the things is that I am much more boring than any of the characters that I could write. So I always <laughs> find it very interesting when people think that I could be those characters. Uh, but I definitely took uh, the understanding of what um, anxiety was, what depression was from, my, from myself. And then I could feed that into Queenie because I had um, had such a bad episode of that when I was 23, I think until I was around 25. And so I knew what that was like. And in a way I wanted people who were experiencing the same thing, but weren't able to talk about it a lot less slowly because I knew that in a, in a way that Marion said, I couldn't be the only person that was going through this, but mental health issues are so stigmatized, even to this day in the black community, that I could not find anyone talking about it, not even in my family, I wasn't allowed to. Uh, and my friends, it was the same thing. It was like, oh, we're all just told to be strong. So just like, just forget it. And that was so tough. And so Queenie for me became a way of putting this, this, this thing that I'd been feeling into this, into this character, this person and kind of showing that she could live a life with it, even if I couldn't, because I had so much time not being able to live with it. And so, yeah, clear distinction between me and that character, but also we share some things. And I, I've spoken about how Marin has been, you know, really bringing readers these fantastic characters and stories for, I hate to say this now, Marin, uh, tw <laughs> over 25 years now. That's a generation. Um, but you've still got plenty more stories to tell. But Candice, you're very much, I, I wouldn't say sort of, you know, carrying the baton on, but you're talking in the same way with, with popular fiction and stories, but talking about these really hard hitting issues and also the very modern issues. So of course, social media plays a really important role um, with people person with the character of Dimple. Um, she's seeing the world through this sort of lens, I suppose, of social media, and it has a huge impact on her mental health. And then she has to deal with these uh, topics that I'm afraid we hear headlines about, like revenge porn and things like that. Can you tell me a little bit about 
incorporating these very modern um, aspects of mental health, these new things that are having a massive impact on, on young people today? Um, well, also just to say that I feel very much like my, my work is kind of hopefully in conversation with Marion's. I have a woman, a lovely Irish woman called Geraldine, who DMs me once a week and she's like, you know, you remind me of Marion a lot of the time. And she said it to me like once a week and I'm like, oh, thank you so much, Geraldine. And her love is that I get to talk about the things that are concerning, I guess, my communities and Marion does the same thing. So it's very nice. I love talking to Geraldine. Shout out Geraldine. Um, but yeah, I think like, I can't help but see what's going on in the world. And it feels like, I guess at this point, it's my job to kind of document it. And a lot of the time when I'm talking about South London, um, I'm kind of documenting a place that's changing. And so in, in this way, I'm kind of documenting a landscape that is changing. And there are so many ways to be, I guess, like depressed now and so many, so many avenues to, to, to be lonely. And social media is definitely one of those. And that's definitely a difference that I've seen between growing up. Because luckily, I feel very lucky that I didn't grow up with social media in my life. And it was a thing when I was in my 20s. Um, and seeing it now and seeing the effects now. And, and, and I have a little sister who routinely leaves Instagram. And I'm always like, why? And she's like, because I can't take it because it's too much, too many people. And I just don't have that relationship to it. I'm kind of like, I'm here, I post a picture and then I go. Um, but I see that the, the, the younger generation, um, that there are so many, there's so many ways for people to hurt you and for you to be hurt. And it felt like a responsibility to kind of talk about that and to look at that. Mm. It is interesting, isn't it? I think you and I, from a similarish generation, although you're a bit younger than me, sort of having seen social media appear and no less addicted to it, I'm sure ourselves now, but, uh, you know, not so shaped by it from day one. And I had a thing the other day where I was quite used to, um playing like computer games when i was a kid but there was no such thing as online gaming then so you play computer games with your friends they came around and you played together and you chatted together when you weren't actually playing the game and all that sort of stuff whereas now because the kids are so used to playing games online even when they come over to visit they do this thing where if they're not playing the game with their friend they're when they're sitting to the side they're not talking to each other they're on their phones doing something else they're playing another game or doing something and I was really confused by this sort of thing of being together but alone in the same space or sort of isolated which I was like what's going on this is so weird but this idea of loneliness which is the theme for this year's mental health awareness week is really interesting because loneliness it doesn't just mean being on your own does it I mean tell, tell us a little bit about how it affects some of the characters in people person for example uh, so I think they're all they're all all five half siblings that are lonely in some way, and that, that isn't just because their dad is not a part of their life. That is because I think one of the things that I'm definitely exploring in this is the the absent parent and and how the effect that that has on you as you grow up and the attachment issues that you have and how you are then with other people in your in your in your adult life. And so loneliness is a big part of that when you have when you have been in a way left behind. Uh, and so you kind of make yourself lonely because you push people away because you think they're going to leave you anyway. And so that's definitely, um, yeah, loneliness is, is, is something that I also think, of, you know, I'm, I'm quite a, I like being alone, but luckily I don't feel lonely, but I definitely have kind of come through that because of therapy, you know? Yeah. Julie, I'm going to bring you in here because this idea of um, loneliness, it, it, of course, is one of the things to be aware of in a slide towards depression, that sort of that desire to be alone, to take yourself away from other people. But what are obviously loneliness is something that's come to the fore over the last couple of years because of lockdown and the isolation that people had. A lot of people found themselves feeling very lonely. What are the things I suppose to look out for in yourself that might be warning signs and, and what can we then do to tackle that idea of loneliness? Well, I guess you know, everyone has a, a, a different uh, set of signs, I guess. And, and it's really about being in touch with how you're feeling and, and what's going on for you. Um, and in terms of, you know, different signs, I guess it can be the, the strange thing about loneliness is that even though it is a sign that you have this need for genuine and good quality human connection, it also gives you the urge to withdraw further because of the low mood that it sort of instigates and then, and then you start to feel um, like, you know, it's all a bit too much to be around people. And, and sometimes you can get that sense of, 
I've forgotten how to be around people and I'm not sure how to do this and how to connect with people. And so once you feel that sense of disconnection, it sort of grows and, and makes the idea of uh, initiating connection feel pretty scary. Um, so, you know, you might notice, you might, if you don't notice the feeling, you might notice, wow, I haven't been calling my friends for the last few weeks or I've turned down the last few invitations because I haven't really felt like it. Um, and maybe I'm filling that space with something else. Maybe that's social media. Maybe that's, you know, hours of Netflix or whatever it is. Um, it, the, you know, it's that shift from wanting to be with people and finding it relatively easy to do so to it or feeling like a, a bit of a sort of huge deal. Um, earlier on, Marion, you were saying that, that for you, writing is very much not a catharsis. It's not therapy. And Candice, would you say that it's the same for you, that, that you, writing is not a therapeutic exercise for you? Therapy is. Yeah, no, for sure. Because I think like uh, there is this, there is this, there's an understanding that, that women writers just write autobiographically and it's just an outpouring. But actually it, writing is, it has to be very exacting. It has to be very precise. It's a job like everything, like every other job anyone does. Mm. Um, and I, I don't take offense to it, but I just find it very irritating <laughs> uh, because there is a suggestion that we just sit down and we're just like, oh my God, we're women with feelings and we have to walk <laughs> on the page. And it's like, mm. how? Like, I, I, don't get, I don't get like awards and, and money because of my feelings. Like I do my work, I work very hard. Um, and so yes, big, big distinction. Thank you, Mario, big distinction. <laughs> Um, and so, yeah, no, it's very much, I have therapy and also my work is just a different part of my life. My work is my work and my life is my life. Yeah. And that, well, that separation is, is necessary. Absolutely. I mean, what's really interesting, Julie, is that, that many writers will say that for them, writing is not therapy, whereas journaling can be a very important way for people to deal with mental health issues and, and approach therapy. What is the difference, I suppose, between writing fiction that Marion and, and Candice do and the usefulness of actually sitting down to write your own thoughts down for, in, in a journal to, to help deal with mental health? Sure. So, you know, an author is is crafting a story and that's that is a craft in itself. Right. That's it's a profession and there are lots of skills involved in doing that. The idea of journaling is something you don't need uh, those those writing skills to do. All you have to be able to do is find words to um, to associate with the different feelings that you're having. And, you know, expressive writing now has lots of uh, evidence base behind it for being really, really helpful in helping people to process emotion. Um, so, you, you know, just just writing down and it's, it's a great way to begin that journey of sort of self-reflection and learning a bit more about how your own mind works. Um and, it, it, you know, people often ask lots of questions to me about, you know, how, how should I do it? How do I get it right? How do I know if I'm getting it wrong? And it's really not about that. It's about getting thoughts out of your head and onto the page. There is no need to craft it. There's no need to make it readable to anybody else. You've just got to uh, get it onto the page and then have a good look. And, and what it gives you is a bit of a bird's eye view. Uh, and it's often really, really messy. Right. So, you know, there's no sort of order to it. It can sometimes be confusing. But you're giving yourself a bit of a bird's eye view of that mess, which is easier to navigate than if it's all sort of right in front of your eyes. Um, Nihal, I'm going to bring you in now, m m in no small part, because the first note I've written down by your name is what's the nature of a good interview? And I presume it's not leaving one of your interviewees hanging on for 25 minutes whilst you talk to everybody else. So I'm really sorry. But it's this is the nature of the conversation. Um, now that I've got you. Uh, your interviews I've spoken to several people since I said that I was going to be talking to you for the podcast and I cannot tell you how many people have complimented you on the interviews that you do and the nature of your book is to explain some of what you've learned through your career as an interviewer and what what works for you and uh, what one thing I sort of allied with was that I have, can't tell you how many times I've done an interview with an author and they seem genuinely grateful and surprised even that I've read the book from cover to cover and come to the conversation with some kind of knowledge and it made me realize it took me a while to realize this that a lot of interviews that you hear and see on tv and radio they haven't read the book they haven't got they've got some prepared questions they kind of get through them and there's a really big difference isn't there between those two conversations could you give us a little indication about about how you approach interviews and, and when what you feel makes it a great interview well i think the major distinction between those two types of interviews is respect I think that if someone has taken the time to write a book and craft it and 
display their artistry. Writing books, as far as I'm aware, from the hundreds of authors I've interviewed, is not easy. <laughs> it's an incredibly <laughs> time-consuming, thought-plundering uh, journey. And the least I can do is read the damn thing, right? It's the least thing I can do. And also, as well, authors, you too, you know when he or she hasn't read the book. <laughs> you know, right? So I approach it with the thought that you are a professional and that whether you've made an album or you've wrote a book or you've directed a film or you've produced a film or a TV series, I owe you the respect to know what I'm talking about when I come to speak to you. And I also know that on occasion in the past, when I haven't done that, I've come away from it feeling terrible about it. And sometimes the person on the other end hasn't as much, but I have because I realized that I haven't got as much out of those 45 minutes. Because remember, and you know, I mean, fair play to certain other presenters and interviewees, they've got six or seven minute interviews. I do 45 minute interviews. I do long interviews. And if you want to try and blag yourself through 45 minute interviews with a very <laughs> clever person like Mariana Candy, like, and you, Julie, of course, um, you're going to come unstuck really quickly. And I don't have any prepared questions written down, not one. What I do have is a bank of knowledge. And then based on what you say, I can pull out a bank a piece from that bank of knowledge and then use that to propel the conversation over. I mean, my book, Let's Talk, could have been over in one sentence. You know, let's talk. And then it says how to have better conversations. Actually, it could be over in one word. Listen, that's the whole problem with how poor conversations are now. We transmit and broadcast rather than receive. And social media has enhanced that. Uh, politicians by the way they call, want to divide polemicists editorials he or she who shouts loudest gets the most attention but we're not learning anything from that and then also the kind of pernicious presence of this thing it all adds up to actually quite a worrying situation about how we are so when i joined five live and started to interview people as I'd always done, but I'd done it on the BBC Asian network. So fewer people had listened to it. So many listeners would go, wow, you're actually listening. It's like, well, but that's what a conversation is. How is that a revelatory thing? How can, how poor can some of my contemporaries be at their job that you as a listener find it extraordinary that the person doing the interviewing is listening to the interviewee. That was, I was like, what? And that's really the spur for writing the books. I thought, well, where are we then? Where are we then if people find that interesting? And don't just listen to me and say, well, you're a professional at it. Actually, these are just skills I learned and they're transferable skills. I'm not Usain Bolt in this, right? Like, <laughs> I'm not like the only person in the world that can do this. We can all do this. You know, we can all just learn to be better at it. So you say about transferable skills. So I, I, I was an actor for, for many years and um, moving into talking about books and then sort of interviewing authors and feeling a sort of, I guess, a natural propensity towards doing that. And I realised that that actually came from my acting so that in a play, obviously, you have your lines and you know that other people know their lines. You do have to do a bit of listening because you have to hear your cue before you start talking. But you're very much in the moment. But in improvisation, which is all part of the training of acting, there is this thing about absolutely having to listen to what the other person is saying so that you can then accept, as they say in theatre, and build on what they've said. And that kind of back and forth is how you build your imp improvisation. And that's the same as conversation goes. For you, what, you have sort of moved into this area of being an, an interviewer, but I wondered whether the, you know where the roots of that came from in your childhood or even sort of a little bit later. Why do you think you are good at it? Um. Well, because I'm curious. So if you're curious, you'll always want to ask questions, won't you? Mm. You'll always want to know. And I'm curious about human beings. You know, the questions that I'm asking, I mean, sometimes 
your editors want a news line. So for instance, I interviewed John Bon Jovi and his PR said, please don't talk about his daughter's drug overdose. And I was like, why would I want to? Mm. Like, why would I want to, for the sake of entertainment, pry into the darkest, most horrible aspects of parenthood and the worst fears of parenthood? Why would I want to expose him to that? But what ends up happening is you have an extraordinary conversation with someone and they either naturally open up to you because you care. You just, it's a horribly glib, oh, but I care. I really care. But I do, you know, whether it's, whether it's John Bon Jovi or whether it's someone who, you know, who's a sex worker who did have her three children taken away from her, but she, she's a sex worker and an addict and she, Colette in Manchester, and she chose to open up about that. You know, I'm not here just to get a crass news line for the sake of it. I want to have a conversation with you, you know, and I want to, and that comes largely. My mother was a nurse for 35 years in the NHS. And we, and I write about this in the book. We couldn't walk through Harlow town in Essex where I grew up without people coming up to her because over that period of time, she'd fixed everyone. <laughs> <laughs> like a, these people would go all different ages and they'd come and tell her about how their ailments are getting on. And as a kid, obviously, you're just like, all you want to do is get to the toy shop or the sweet shop, right? That's all you want to do. So you're like kind of tugging, really. But I don't know, through osmosis, I just witnessed this amazing woman, my mum, just talk to everybody and listen to them. And it doesn't matter where they were from, doesn't matter their colour, their size, whatever. She would just talk to them. And I wonder, I do the job I do and do it so others say as well as I do, largely because of her. You know, she just listened to people and she never judged them. She just wanted to hear about them. Yeah. Well, one of the things you're saying... Oh, you're... Maybe she did judge them. Yeah, actually, <laughs> true. Maybe she did. <laughs> maybe she did because she, she's human. But uh, but yeah, she, but she was brilliant. Yeah, she is brilliant. Um, one of the things you mentioned in your book is that the one thing that maybe makes your job slightly easier is that when people come to speak with you, they are ready to talk about whatever it is they're there to talk about. They're prepared for that. Um, but Julie, when people come in to see you, that may not be the case. Um, or if somebody is dealing with something difficult, uh, they may not be ready to talk about it. What are the keys to unlocking the conversation if somebody isn't quite there yet? Um, I think patience is a big one. I've certainly worked with people who desperately want help, but have no idea how to verbalize everything. So you spend, you spend time making friends with silence and, and you accept that it's difficult and you, and you, you are willing to, to sit with someone and contain whatever emotions are there and, and be accepting of whatever emotions are there and, and, and withhold judgment. So, I mean, you know, you talked in hell about curiosity. It, it's, it's, you know, you, you can't stop thoughts from arriving in your mind, but you can park criticism and turn towards curiosity constantly. And that's really what the therapy room is all about. And um, so I think you develop, even through sitting in silence, you develop trust through that time. And, and, you know, some people will talk in the first few moments of arriving and not take a breath until they leave and others will take weeks and weeks to get to that point. Um, so it's really about um, trusting the process, allowing someone to do things in their own time and all the while that you're working through that journey, um, showing them that you're someone to be trusted and and that this is a place of sanctuary that that person can use however they however they like to so um you know you don't have to talk about the the really difficult stuff straight away either i think you know often when people are trying to support a friend for example um they kind of almost dread going to see them because they imagine that they've they're supposed to talk about the really difficult stuff all the time they're with them and actually for someone who's struggling having your friend come and distract you for an hour from, from the distress that you feel most of the time can be great, you know? Having someone to have a little laugh with and a cup of tea with, that can be just as helpful as talking about the really tough stuff. So, you know, I think when you're supporting someone, you don't have to be their therapist. That, you know, like being a, a writer, that's a, a profession in itself with, a you know, lots of honed skills. So 
I think people sort of put themselves on a bit of a pedestal on that front. You mentioned how the, the word listen could be the one word sort of description of your book in terms of how to have better conversations. And you both mentioned that, that the Chinese symbol uh, for listening is actually a very complicated symbol. It has many parts to it because listening is not just simply about waiting to talk, for example. Um, and I wondered if we could maybe touch on some of those things. Um, uh, this is not a test uh, to see how much you've retained, but obviously the symbol includes um, ears to hear and, and eyes to see. Undivided attention, I thought, was a really interesting part of it. But even more so, perhaps, this idea of trying to put yourself in the person that you're listening to's mind to try and work out what it is they're trying to say. Because, of course, what you're trying to say and what you do say are not always the same thing. Um is that a fair summation of, of the symbol, listen? Um, Julia, I'll come to you first, and then Nihal, you can explain more. Um, certainly, I think when you're talking about good quality listening, there's this Im really important distinction between sympathy and empathy. And if you imagine someone is stuck down a deep hole and they're screaming, you know, please, someone help me. Sympathy is sort of standing next to that hole, looking down, saying, oh, gosh, that, lo that looks terrible. You know, good luck with that. And, and empathy is grabbing a ladder, climbing down into the hole with them, saying, yes, this, this is awful. Let's work out how we can get out together. Mm. And, and that doesn't mean you necessarily put yourself into the problem with someone. It, it's it's a, a way of being with someone that allows you to be so open to their experience that you allow you enable yourself to sit in it with them, sit in that pain, you know, whatever pain they're bringing to the room, you, you, you're open to sitting in that with them so that you're sort of walking through the journey hand in hand. And, and Nihal, for you, that this symbol was brought to your attention by John Sutherland, who's a hostage negotiator. So this is a, a conversation where somebody might be outright hostile and also where time is of the essence. We've spoken about the patience to listen to somebody and making a friend with silence. But presumably with hostage negotiation, the stakes are so much higher. Oh, I mean, the conversation I had with John Sutherland for the book was extraordinary. And the fact that he brought this ancient symbol, Ting, as it's called in Chinese, into our conversation was thought provoking because you just wouldn't think that in the maelstrom of different things that are going on, potentially deadly things that are going on around him, that he would draw upon something so ancient and then teach it to cadets. Uh, in the Metropolitan Police about this, because it, we think we're listening, right? But when you look at this Chinese symbol and it says about the eyes and the ears, but it also says about the mind and the heart, that you have to be completely involved in listening. And there's lots of research that will tell you that just by having your mobile phone on a table while you're having a conversation with someone there's a number of things going on there one is that the person opposite you subconsciously say well they're willing to be interrupted by that phone therefore i'm not going to share as much i'm not we're not going to go as deep equally what you're saying to that person is that anything that you say is as is really only of equal importance to this and i'm willing to be interrupted by this you may be mid sentence and if this goes off i go i'm sorry i need to check it mm. johan hari in his book stone and focus and i interviewed johan hari for this because i felt that it dovetailed talking about the problems we have with attention now and conversation he was saying that on average if you're interrupted it will take you 23 minutes on average to get back to the level of focus you had when you were trying to get something across to someone so it's really important that we understand that when we're listening, it is something that requires respect again, but we need to be fully involved in the person that we're listening to. And I'm not saying ban these things, but I had lunch with my pal on Saturday and he put it on the table and I asked him to put his phone away. I just said, can, can it be out of sight? Because we're, otherwise we're just, what are we saying to each other? Yeah. And I'm actually becoming quite a, a zealot about this. I'm not anti-technology. There's some amazing work done by um, Professor Sherry Turkle from MIT about this. She's been writing about this for years. And she wrote a book, weirdly enough, what you were saying earlier on, called Alone Together, about what technology, how we've 
transferred this meaning of togetherness to technology and it's not giving us back what we thought it would so don't ban it but just be uh, just un understand what it's doing to us and especially what it's doing to a younger generation we you know my kids are 12 and 14 so they're they're in the zone right <laughs> especially my 14 year old but we we heavily ration it we were four of us were coming back on a train a two-hour train journey yesterday uh and they have to go away they have to go away and next time you're out and about if you're at a shopping mall which has a food area i mean in manchester where i live we've got the trafford center which is like the vatican of shopping <laughs> centers it's like the biggest thing in the world it's horrendous right it's got like gold and marble and it's like a indian billionaire's house uh, that's not racist it just is what it is Indians <laughs> like marble and gold um and uh especially very rich ones and and i walked around this was in january you know as i was finishing the book and i looked at all of these people with each other doing this with each other and i wondered what were they getting from each other they were they were socializing but not connecting mm. and i found that kind of profoundly sad and again the book is a warning to say look just i'm not a luddite just say look just understand what this is doing it's not innocuous right it's pernicious potentially mm. and you should be aware of that because conversation is such it's such a wonderful thing such a beautiful thing you know i'm definitely an evangelist for that <laughs> Um, Candice, you, you, I know that you use social media, but I think you're quite careful about how you use it and the relationship that you have with it. You mentioned earlier that because of growing up into it rather than with it, you're able to sort of put it to one side if necessary. How do you do that and, and how do you manage your relationship with social media? Yeah. Um, also, just to say, I've been interviewed by Nihal a couple of times now and it has struck me so much. I, I realised after the second time that there is every time I answer a question, a three to five second pause where he's just listened to me and he's processing what I've said and he's gonna answer the next, ask the next, ask the next question. And that, that was the only interview that's ever done that. And initially I was like, what's going on? And I was like, he just listened. And that's amazing. So thank you, Michal. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I don't care about it that much. Like I think I, I, I feel quite lucky in that way because I have, uh, I, have a, I have a lot of friends and I feel very grateful to have those friends and I spend time with them. And that to me will never be replaced by uh, social media. Like I, I use it to post the stuff that I'm doing. Uh, and like, I've got a book coming out. Here's where you can get it. Here's what I'm doing. I'm doing this today. I'm signing this day. I'm going to be here. But apart from that, I don't really use it as like a Twitter, really like a space to be like opinions, thoughts. Like what does everyone, because I feel like I get that from my friends. Mm. Um, and I feel, I feel very lucky in, in that way. But I try to hold on to those human interactions as much as I can, because I know how easy it is to sort of rely on on Twitter and just kind of use that as like a as as your space for for finding out new things and for talking to people but also sometimes I think it's like say it to your friends I think I see a lot of stuff where people are really angry or they're really upset or something's happened and it's like I wish you would have gone to your friends instead of sharing that on, on social media because I feel like you're not getting what you what you would usually get from someone who actually cares about you and someone who knows about you instead mm -hmm. you've got all these strangers weighing in and weighing in is very different to your friends who, who care about you um and so yeah I try to I try to keep that a, a big separation and also I think because I've done that for so long I'm just not really interested in being like hey world what do you think about this um but people who do that it's like fine because I know that some people don't have um huge sort of like social communities but mm. digital ones are, are just, are work, just, just work just as well for them but I think that there are downsides to that Marin, anybody who's read any of your books will know immediately that you have clearly listened or eavesdropped on many a great conversation because your ear for dialogue is incredible. And so what I wanted to know was when you're sitting down to write a book, there are elements of research, I'm sure, that come into it, but the characters and the way that they talk and, and this seems to me to be, a, without being too stereotyped, I do think that Irish writers seem to be so much better at this than their English counterparts, for example. What is it about conversation and capturing the essence of it in fiction that, how do you do that so well? Um, thank you very much, Will. Um, 
this is such a cliche, but I mean, being Irish is about, it's about conversation. Um, and, you know, without going into our history, you know, for a long time, words and music were all that we had. You know, we weren't allowed to own property. Um, we weren't allowed to speak our native language. We couldn't pra practice our religion. You know, we couldn't own land. Um, kind of everything was taken away except our, our words. And also Irish people speak English according to the rhythm of, of our first language, which is Irish, you know, which is a completely different grammatical structure. And because of that, I, I can tell the difference immediately, you know, between how Irish people will convey information and, and British people. And I think I've grown up with that duality and, you know, the different people speak in different ways. And I mean, and also I grew up in a house where storytelling mattered, where, you know, mimicry, doing the voices, getting the essence was something that my mother encouraged. She's very good at herself. And, and, and I mean, on a personal level, like I love, I love interesting turns of phrase. I love how people can convey something in a very bold way or in a very lyrical, colourful way. And I will always want the lyrical, colourful way. Um, you know, why use one word when, you know, a thousand will do is kind of, it's a very Irish thing. And, I, you know, I know it's a cliche, but I mean, there is truth in it. Um, I value language. I value how language mutates, you know, how it's, it's in the process all the time of becoming something different, even though, you know, like there's the Oxford English Dictionary, it's attempted to codify um, words. Um, and, and one of the things actually that I get from social media is, is that change, you know, um, not just new slang, but like different sentence con construction. Um, I love, you know, if I had my time again, I would love to study language. Um, I, I, and coming back to that thing, you know, of eavesdropping, um, I kind of think there's nothing creepier than the idea of an author sitting behind someone on the bus with like a little notebook and then writing down everything. But I, I appreciate, I appreciate conversation and I appreciate people who, who are entertaining, I suppose. Um, I know that sounds kind of judgy about people who aren't entertaining. I also appreciate them because they're conveying information in a very efficient way. I like I like conversation, I suppose, is the long and the short of it. And I've taken forever to say that. But yeah, that which, of course, is on brand. Um, but yeah, <laughs> that's it. I actually have a notebook that says on the front of it in gold letters, um, careful or I'll put you in my novel, which I, I feel like you should be given that. Um, Julie, I want to come to you because one of the things that slightly blew my mind reading your book was this idea that um, the mind, of course, is part of the body, uh, but it's affected by the body. And so that when we talk about mental health, when we talk about dealing with those issues, these things are, are, are rooted in the body and that sometimes it is about doing something physical first as the means of dealing with something that feels like it's in your head. I'm going to quote you to you. Uh, you. You say, we must not wait until we feel like it because feeling like it doesn't come first. The action must come first. The feeling follows on after. Could you tell us a little bit about how that works and why the, the physical action can sometimes be the thing that will help you to deal with the mental problem? Sure. So, I mean, I always like to think of it as you know the different aspects of your experience so you can break it down into you know some fundamental parts so the thoughts that are going through your mind and that sort of inner dialogue that we all have the emotions that you feel or don't feel at the time the physical sensations that come with that and then your behavior so what you do or don't do and the urges you have that you might go with or go against and the thing is that they, the, the reason I say they're like weaves in a basket is because although they're all part of the experience, they're so tightly woven together, we don't experience them individually, we sort of, we experience the basket, right? And so what we do in therapy is we start to unpick some of that and take them apart so that people can become aware of how the different parts influence each other. 
because there's no emotion on or off switch, right? It, you know, imagine if you could wake up in the morning and say, right, today I want to feel love and joy. And then they just happened. Um, and it would be, would be lovely and I'd be out of a job probably, but, um, <laughs> you know, it, it, it isn't there. And so, but we know that how we feel is so, so closely connected to all of those other aspects of our experience that we have some degree of control over. So if we start to adjust some of those, then how we feel has to change too. And, and that's where, I mean, and it's quite a sort of hopeful message really that you don't have to be at the mercy of how you feel. You know, you can't control uh, emotional responses to certain things, but you can make adjustments to it and you can adjust the impact that it has on you with certain skills that you develop. And and, and the quote there is from sort of the, the section on motivation, I think, isn't it? And it's the idea that, you know, if you if you wait until that feeling arrive, that feeling of motivation, if you wait for it to arrive before you do the thing you set yourself to do, then it's probably not going to happen because that that feeling of sort of energy and motivation is a feeling you get when you're walking out of the gym, not when you're walking in. You know, it's a sort of you have to, you know, uh, sort of act opposite to the urge to stay in bed in order to get there um and it's probably the same i mean i this was my writing experience but i had to get over a huge hump every day to start getting words on the page and um and it was only once i sort of almost tipped out of my flow and thought oh oh i've written a thousand words this is great and then and you know and you just have this moment of realizing i'm doing it i'm doing it and then you know and then you fall off but um <laughs> but you know those lovely moments are after you've made the action work so for me it was really about and often in therapy it's often about helping people to realize that the relationship is a two-way relationship so if you can begin with some of the action and those changes that are really difficult to do and you don't feel like doing them then it has an impact on your how you feel and then when your feelings start to change it becomes easier to do the right thing as well one of the other things you say in your book is that um having more words for the feelings that, that we have can help us to deal with them better um and i wondered whether that sometimes it'd be quite hard to do that in isolation to, to find those words and it occurred to me that it would be so much easier to to enlarge your vocabulary of emotion in conversation with somebody else because then that other input could maybe help you find the right words is that true is that why conversation could be so important with somebody else? absolutely there's some great research on this now and um, and they call it sort of emotional granularity and it's this idea of if you can um, sort of have words to associate with really sort of in fine detail these different moments and different feelings that pop up um, that that helps you to to deal with that emotion and and um, you know the advice around improving that vocab is you know yes being conversation really Read, read all sorts of things you can and that's what you know that's the beauty of how fiction can be so helpful too when you when you see other people uh you know in a story going through something and they're expressing themselves in a way that you might not have encountered before and you take that on board and then you've got that to use if you come up against something similar and um you know it's it's being able to sort of verbalize and give a name to certain feelings that then helps us to predict what's going to happen with those feelings and how we then need to deal with them. Um, but ha having said that, lots of people say to me, how do I know if I'm feeling anxious? How do I know if I'm feeling scared? How do I know if I'm feeling something else? And there's this sort of fear around not using the right word. And it's less important to use the same word that everyone else is using and more important to just create a little map of your own about your own sort of emotional state and, and your own mental health. Um, to finish off, I, I want to come to all of you to think about one thing which is that people sometimes are put off uh trying to deal with the problem because they think they have to fix the problem immediately and it's sometimes more helpful to think of these things as being a work in progress constantly that, that it's not something that's just going to be fixed and we move on that we'll be dealing with them maybe for a long time marion obviously having been through your own experiences with mental health and therapy addiction recovery the the idea of relapsing the idea of recovery being a constant process is is so woven in there is that does it feel like a lifetime project and uh dealing with some of those issues in fiction is it something that you're just constantly working on and it's not going to ever be finished um it, it's definitely not something that's ever going to be finished you know and on a daily basis my recovery is on a spectrum you know i mean I haven't really ever been in danger of relapse, but you know, I've had days when my thinking has been very destructive. Um, and yeah, nothing is fixed or constant. There, it's, it's not binary. Um, I mean, 
And I don't know if I'm going to keep revisiting um, recovery in my fiction, but in my personal life, definitely, you know, every day I wake up and it's a new day and, you know, I only have today's sobriety. Um, and it's all about what can I do right now in this moment to get me through today, you know, without thinking in a really destructive way and putting myself in danger of relapsing. And that sounds kind of really grim. You know, it sounds like a, a real sort of brutal kind of life sentence of a thing. It, for me, it doesn't feel like that at all. I feel like I've been given this incredible freedom um, and I'm asked to do small little things every day so that I can stay free. Um, that's that's how my, that's my experience, you know, and that good things like, you know, good mental health or, or recovery. It, we don't just do one thing and we're fixed. You know, we, we have it's it is ongoing and that's a bargain we have to make with ourselves. I think people get very cross when they think, well, I was depressed and, and now I have to keep doing these things so I'm not depressed anymore. It's like, <laughs> yes, I'm sorry, you do. This is the brutal truth of it, but isn't it better to feel well and having to do those little jobs than feeling absolutely wretched and lying in bed? And that sounds very bossy and yeah, but more, but that is, you know, you have to do the work and you have to do the work on an ongoing basis and you're far likelier to have a better life if you do mm. and candice you mentioned earlier your own experiences of anxiety therapy and then sort of moving on would you know has your own personal experience chime with what what marion was saying there about the, the constant work required yeah absolutely and i think like one of the things that it's like a, it is a daily check-in um, and I really cannot and I do not let the small stuff sweat me because I'm always like it's just great to be here because there is a reality where I wasn't and so it's just kind of like every single day there is not a day that goes by that something doesn't annoy me and I'm like but you could also not be here and then it's gone I just they, they, I can't think about it anymore because they're just that they, that thing is so big um, and so yeah it is a daily thing but also I'm very very grateful for it because it, it does it definitely keeps me level and it stops me from sort of going off about things that are actually, in the grand scheme, really inconsequential. Mm. Um, Nihal, there are some revelatory conversations in your book, particularly around the difficult conversations that have to happen when there seem to be two parties that are intractable. So the, in, in Northern Ireland, um, for example, presumably that gives you hope that there is no conversation that is too difficult to have and no situation that co couldn't potentially be resolved through talking about it. Well, I mean, one of the people I interviewed for the book is the Emmy award winning filmmaker Dia Khan, who did a documentary called White Right Meeting the Enemy, where as a Muslim woman, she embedded herself with American neo Nazis and spent some time with them. And at the end of the documentary, and I, I can't recommend that documentary highly enough, and it's why I wanted her in the book, I think two or three of them ended up leaving their neo-Nazi organizations because they'd never met someone like her before. Mm. They'd never had a conversation. They'd never humanized her. But also equally, she said that the title meeting the enemy, you make the assumption that she's meeting the enemy, but she had to accept that they were also meeting their enemy. And she had to understand why it was that to them, she was their enemy. And, you know, reading fiction, is, is an empathy gym, as they call it, right? And she is an empathy kind of nuclear power generator, really, <laughs> you know, especially in that context, because people's eyebrows go up. I mean, imagine a Muslim woman just spending time with these guys, you know, who she also said that she learned to not define them entirely by that one thing. And nobody had ever done that before. And they learned not to define her by the color of her skin and her faith. And when you interview that, and I interviewed Mary McAleese for the book as well about how you navigate through that, the Northern Ireland peace process, and you invite loyalist paramilitaries into your home. And one of the things she said was there was no question at any point that these people would come in through the side door or the back door. They came in through the front door of our house. So the openness, with which Mary McAleese and John Sutherland as a police crisis negotiator and Dia Khan brought to the conversations just gave me hope because we all have conversations that we're scared of having in our personal lives, in our professional lives, 
And I just wanted to leave that chapter particularly out there for people to go, okay, that's what's possible mm. if we talk to each other. And I think that's, that's powerful and profound, really. Mm. Julie, um, your book is an amazing toolkit for anybody to pick up and have a, a load of ideas about how to deal with a, a real range of, of mental health problems. Because um, you say, of course, that not everybody can afford to go to a therapist and the, the weeks or months uh, of therapy that might be required. Um, for anybody who is listening, who thinks that there is something that they would want to talk about, or perhaps for the friend of somebody who, who wants to initiate that conversation with somebody who they think might need help, is there a, is there a first step that, that helps to make that a little bit easier? Yeah, um, I think if you're sort of helping someone along the way, you can help with the, the practical stuff. You know, once someone has decided, I don't think therapy is something you can force anyone into because if you're not engaged and willing to do the work, then then you won't reap all the benefits from it and uh you know it's not a pill it's not something that once it's once it's done it'll do its work without you know you have to constantly like mariam saying you have to constantly put in the work and and it's not easy um and so i think in terms of supporting someone to to access um help and things like that i guess the way that you can do that is is show them that you're you have their back and and you you believe in them and you know that it, you know they can make some changes and that they have a greater potential than than what they're currently living and and there's a real power to believing in someone genuinely like that um and then the help can become kind of smaller you know that um it can be practical you know I'll, I'll, help, I'll drive you to the appointment or i'll you know look after your kids while you're there or whatever it is and those sorts of things you know you don't have to be the therapist you don't have to be the the healer um that, that makes it all go away you know that's a that's a huge ask and and not realistic and often not helpful because they have to work through that journey themselves so um walking alongside someone being their friend and if you're not sure how to help it's okay to ask it's okay to say how can I best support you through this? Because people will have an idea and they'll let you know, don't do that. That's really not helpful, but help in this way. That's that's going to be a great help. I could talk to you all for so much longer, but I don't want to test the patience of our listeners or indeed take up more of your time. Um, thank you so much. It's been brilliant to, to talk to all of you about this. Um, I should mention that, again, Rachel uh, by Marion Keys, People Person by Candice Carty Williams, and Why Has Nobody Told Me This Before by Dr. Julie Smith are all out in Waterstones now. Uh, and Nihal's book, Let's Talk, uh, will be with us in August. Is that right, Nihal? Yeah, 18th of August. 18th of August. There you go. Thank you for sharing a little preview of what can be expected in that book today um all that remains for me today is, is thank you and, and have a lovely day all of you thanks thank you thank you thanks everyone